RT344, improved integration of the supply chain in materials planning and work packaging. How would better visibility into the supply chain change your project delivery? The team will present the barriers to supply chain visibility, strategies it found which could improve supply chain visibility in your organization, and the benefits of better visibility. Here to present their findings are Bill O'Brien, the University of Texas at Austin, Annabella Martin, Hilti, Lori Getz, Matrix NAC, Keith Churchill, Bechtel, Chris McConnell, Ontario Power Generation. And from Atlas RFID Solutions, your moderator, Robert Ball. Good afternoon. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here uh, to speak on behalf of Research Team 344, the improved integration of supply chain and material planning and work packaging. Uh, simply stated, linking the supply chain through visibility. We looked at how do we increase supply chain visibility so that we can better inform decisions to increase project performance. So it's not surprising that 40 to 50% of the project cost is related to materials. Yet those materials drive 80% of the project schedule. I, th I think that fact is often overlooked. You know, when we think about uh, adherence to the project schedule and productivity and that thing, we focus on construction, rightfully so, that's where it's most visible. That's where the tip of the iceberg is where we see it. But there's all these hundreds and thousands of decision points that are happening upstream that impact and enable uh, that project schedule. So um, it's, it's uh, the effectiveness of that supply chain uh, has a significant impact on, on that ability. So if we look at uh, the, today's supply chain, why, why is that? If we know that the supply chain has that much impact on project performance, why do we still have some of these challenges? Well, one is it's complex. The, the word's an understatement. It's extremely challenging. Our supply chain professionals do an incredible job of navigating the global ecosystem of supply chain to getting all these hundreds of thousands and millions of materials to the right location at the right time is, is a really impressive feat. Navigating all the geographical locations, time zones, language barriers, transportation logistics challenges, uh, the specs, the, the quality assurance, uh, government regulations, we've, had, we've seen that recently. Uh, it's truly amazing what they do. Uh, but we're, we struggle with it because our, our industry, unlike manufacturing, or something, uh, these projects, our projects are unique. We don't have an iterative process and uh, a, a product that we keep uh, repeating upon to, to do continuous improvement. So one of the things that, that create, is created during that time is that uh, we have disparate systems between these stakeholders. So what that means is we, we don't have a common platform and we don't have a common language in which that information is flowing. So, if I've got a second tier, third tier supplier, information that's going on related to that scope rarely gets to decision makers who need to know when changes happen. And our industry just has a lot of change, which makes it uh, difficult to predict those outcomes. So also, the disparate systems is, is complicated by uh, asymmetric data flow. So what I mean by asymmetric is it, it goes more in one direction than it does the other. So we're very quick to ask from our suppliers and, and those contracts below us to pull that information. Give us a status report, give us your schedule, we want that information. When we get that information, now we're reactive. We're just reacting to the information that we're giving. We rarely will share that and flow it down and empower them to be proactive and, and make their own decisions. So then that's coupled by uh, the, the contract incentives that are often misaligned because we're incentivized to optimize our own silo and, uh, and not the, the overall project. If we have flow, if we have some flexibility, we're gonna hold on to that and not share that for the overall project optimization. So to illustrate this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues who are gonna share uh, a common story on a skit.
Hey, this is Keith. Hey, Keith, it's Chris. Um, just wondering how we're doing on that uh, pipe install in Unit 2. Pretty key milestone for us today, right? Uh, yeah, everything looked good in the three-week look-ahead last week. All the material was supposed to show up, and uh, I'll call and, uh, call and check on that with my GF for you, okay? Oh, that's great. Thanks. All right, I'll get back to you. How about you, Big Cat? Hey, Big Cat, this is, uh, this is Keith. Hey, I was just checking on that pipe install for Unit 2. Uh, you know, it's a big milestone for the client. want to make sure we're still on track. Uh, what do you mean that the material didn't show up? It was supposed to be out in Laydown 3 uh, last week. Did, did, you, did you check on it? No, 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 Big Cat, I'm not calling you a liar. Let me, let me call Lori. I'll call you back. All right, all right, let me call you back. Good afternoon, this is Lori. Hey, Lori, this is Keith. Hey, you just got uh, off the phone with the GF in the field, and he's saying that uh, that material for, for Unit 2 didn't show up last week. Can you, can you check and see what's going on? Yeah, hold on one second. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like it was supposed to be delivered last week. I have no idea what's going on. Let me check with Annabella. All right, get back with me. Thank you. Hello, this is Annabella. Hey, Annabella, it's Lori. Hey, listen, I just got a call from the job site, and they're saying that they didn't get the material for Unit 3 yet, and that unit's supposed to be done today. So what, what's going on? Well, according to the schedule that I have, that material is supposed to deliver next Thursday. Next Thursday? No, mm -hmm. it was supposed to deliver last week. Didn't you get the revised schedule? What revised schedule? The one we sent you about two weeks ago. Oh, the one in the zip file with 5,000 attachments? Yeah, I've had to hire a few interns to go through that, and I don't think they've gotten to that attachment yet. Um, so <laughs> let me see what I can do. I think I might be able to move some things around might be able to get it to you two, three days, but I'm gonna need a revised change order and uh, you'll need to cover my expediting fees. What, are you serious? Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me know what you want me to do. Okay. Bye. Hey, Lori, give me the good news. Uh, it's not good news. Uh, Annabella doesn't think it's shipped. Um, she thinks she might be able to get it out in two or three days, but she wants a revised PO with expedite fees. Uh, with expediting fees. Okay, yeah. uh, let me talk to Chris. Uh, he's, he's not going to be happy. I'll get back yeah. with you. Okay, thank you. Chris, here. boy, that was a quick call back. Thanks. <laughs> hey, Chris, sorry. Uh, I, don't, I don't have better news. Uh, apparently, there was a mix up with the supplier, and they're, uh, they're going to be like two or three days out, but they, they want us to pay for some expediting fees. Just want to know what you want to do. Mike is not going to be happy about this. This is, but so. So you can't do the work because you, you don't have the parts? Oh, I'm, I was out in lay down area two just yesterday. Are, are you sure those parts aren't there? <laughs> so thank you team uh, for that painful reminder of, of project life. Uh, the, that conversation, uh, although it might not be the most important conversation that happens on the job site on that day, it's a conversation that happens every day, multiple times a day on the job site. And you can see where those efficiencies and waste and frustration uh, tend to compound. So what is the impact of, of those, those things? Well, th it creates uncertainty. And the uncertainty is risk. We, we lose confidence in the information that we have. We have to constantly check on that, and, and the way we mitigate that often at the job site to make sure that materials are, are available is we create a buffer inventory, right? So who here loves a full laydown yard? Big pipe spools I can see for days, up on dunnage, end caps nicely secured, name plates visible, right? We love that. Put a bow on it, it's like Christmas. Um, the, the, problem, the problem that happens is there's, a, there's the other side of the, the table, lean construction, Six Sigma, that if it's not work in progress, then by definition, that inventory is waste. We're paying for something that we're not using. So what we're doing is buying ourselves flexibility. And until we really address the root cause of the problem, 
that, that buffer inventory is not going to work. It, it's generally ineffective because we, we often are left with a lot of the wrong material anyway. There's still that 5 10% that still causes that issue. So as a team, uh, we were working through these, these issues early on. We identified, you know, how, just thinking through how can we impact that? How, how can we reduce those expensive inventory costs and at the same time increase our ability to be flexible? And the word that kept coming up over and over was visibility. So we spent a lot of time on that, on visibility, and, and adopted a definition through research that is capture, capturing and analyzing supply chain data that informs decisions, mitigates risks, and improves processes. And the key there is that it informs decisions. So if we're not doing something that we can actually use that information, then we're wasting our time. So once we, we realized the importance of the visibility to our research, we then focused on the decisions of, that need to be made. So we started, we asked a very simple question, yet a very powerful question. Would better supply chain visibility materially change how you do business? The results were pretty staggering. 64% said yes, 31% said maybe. Overall, overwhelming response that just increasing supply chain visibility will have a material effect on your business. So what does that mean? Well, for owners, it's increased ability to meet predictability and productivity requirements, leading to more efficient use of capital. For contractors, it means the ability to better mitigate risks, increase their productivity, and result in increased profitability. And for suppliers, it means a better opportunity for uh, collaborative relationships, to get information from site needs, to be a partner and proactive, the opportunity for better commercial agreements. We all need those things. So our recommendations and our research, and we'll go through this in detail, we focused on making this very practical. So we developed a survey that lets you self-assess uh, your organization, uh, some of the visibility requirements, starting with the decisions that you need to make. So you can identify some of the areas where you may have, have uh, uh, lower scores than, than the benchmark and where opportunities exist. And then we identify enablers. So if we understand the gap of where the, the visibility is, what are the enablers that we can use? And these are things, you're, you're doing them today, a lot of them like frame agreements and track and trace tools and trial allocation, uh, supplier specifications, things like that. Um, but we'll talk about some, uh, some things that can be done to increase the timeliness of that, the trustworthiness of it, the ease of access, the accuracy of it. And then, and then use that and leverage it and align with, with other uh, initiatives in your organization. So we all have some initiative on automation, digitization, uh, AWP, some productivity uh, enhancements. Let's use that as a catalyst because supply chain is very de uh, dependent on that and, and roll that into those initiatives. Uh, our team, I'll talk about that in a second. We've got a great team, really passionate about this. I can tell you there was no group think in our group. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of really good discussions, uh, but I think it was really reflective of, of the audience here as well. So, so we feel, feel like we have a great result, great tool that, that can be used. And uh, at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Bill O'Brien to talk about our approach and those research findings. Great. Thanks, Bobby. And I want to add uh, my thoughts and thanks again to what a great team we've had and such great discussions and really has come together to put, I think, some best-in-class stuff for the industry that we're here to share with you today. And a little reflection on that slide that Bobby showed about would better visibility materially change your business. And really, really strong response there. And what we've really found looking at the literature is that not only is visibility going to really help the day-to-day -day decisions and like my colleague's little story there. Not only will that, that get better, but it's a foundation for fundamental change. This conference has a theme of transformation and visibility has been a key enabler in other industries. We think a key enabler for our industry to really lubricate and change how we do business to speed project delivery, make products more deliverable, reduce cost, increase safety. Now, we'll talk to you a little bit about our research results 
And like any good academic team, we did our homework, we looked at the literature review, we did a review of what's happening, what's what the corporate practices currently are. We did a survey, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we spent a lot of time then defining visibility and around that visibility enablers. And if any of you have done definitions before, you know that takes a lot of work to do well, but we spent a lot of time, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that and share with you definitions that we believe you can use to build into your tools, build into your contracts, build into your processes. And we also did some assessment, just how well are we doing today on top of that. So the survey, 170 responses here, we asked, among other things, where is your visibility today and what's less than adequate? And so a higher number here is bad. And so the very top line says, on-site or work face, and it says about a quarter of respondents said that visibility even on the work face is less than adequate. That's not a great sign, and it gets worse as you go further away, so the sum takeaway from this is the further from the job site, the lower in the visibility, and that affects your jobs every day. So coming back to the definition of supply chain visibility as something that informs action, informs decisions. Just because we can see doesn't mean that you're necessarily doing anything about it to get better. And so we really took this to heart and said we need to have a definitions of visibility that will help to drive action. And so before really digging into visibility, we first looked at what are some key decisions. And we put a boundary on ourselves and went from sort of detailed design through construction, uh, not to say anything the front end is less important, but we needed to start somewhere and say this is the day-to-day -day things that happen. If you look at these decisions, some of them are one time, but many of them happen many times. This really captures much of what goes on in, uh, through detailed design through construction. And so each of these 10 decisions was really rallying points for us, and we looked at that and said, okay, how can we improve here? So let's just take one. So in detailed design, the identify materials and equipment requiring higher visibility. So we pull that out, we identified under that a set of visibility needed items that we as a team from all our various perspectives put together and said if we had insight into all of these, we would say that is ideal. It allows us to drive effective, accurate decisions to advance our projects. And so for each of the decisions, each of those 10 decisions, we have a set. And so we identified 79 visibility needed items across the 10 decisions. And each of these has a definition. Obviously, I can't go through all of those today. They're in our report, which you can download from the app. But just to give you a sense of what are in those definitions, we took the definitions and put them into a word cloud. And so those are the words you see there. And the bigger the word, the more often it occurs. And so supplier, ordering, production, site, availability. These are the things, this is the, this is the visibility that we need to see into every day. Not just for the big items, but for the small items. Now, just if you can see, that's not enough. And so as Bobby had mentioned, we also defined a set of enablers. So for each of these 10 decisions, let's take the one reviewing long lead items and need dates, we said, what are our key enablers that would make this better? So integrated project schedule is one, information specification and contracts. Many of you are doing many of these things today. They should look familiar, but we've identified 76 enablers across the 10 decision items. And so that 76 enablers and 79 is, being items, is a, there in a kind of a self-assessment. You can audit yourself and your projects against the set and see where are we doing well, where do we have gaps. Now these enablers, again, I'm not gonna go into detail each of them, but we put them into a word cloud too, and what are the words that appear there multiple times? Plan, process, report, specification. These are the things that are there to make you more successful, because the visibility items is can we see, the enablers is can we do something with that information to make it actionable and make sure that our corporate institutions and processes and so on can do something and be effective. And so the set of enablers and the set of definitions are really there and ready for you to pull out, self-assess, put into your contracts, put into your information tools. We think these should be a rallying cry for the industry to come around and just unify around this set. Now, it's, definitions are good on their own, but how, do we, how are we performing against them? So we also did some assessment, and we said, 
This is the team self-assessment. For visibility needed items, those 79, how easy is it to get the information and do we trust it once we have it? We also asked for the enablers, well, how frequently do we actually do those well? And so let's kind of see what that looks like. So for detailed design, identifying materials, equipment requiring hard visibility at decision point, one of the, the, the visibility needed items is design dependencies. And so as a self-assessment from the team, we kind of rated on four categories. No access, considerable effort to access, little effort to access, no effort to access or automated. And the darker the color there is, that's where most of the responses were. For this one, considerable effort to access was the uh, most frequent response. We did the same thing for trustworthiness of the data or accuracy. From consistently unreliable, incorrect information is common, incorrect information is uncommon, or is it consistently reliable? And there, it may be hard to get for this item, but most people respond, inf incorrect information is uncommon. So once we have it, we mostly trust it. Well, what's that look like across all 79? Obviously, we're not gonna call out each one, but you can just look, each of those rows there is one of the 79 items across those 10 decisions in three phases. So first thing to note is a widespread, so we're all over the place. But if you look at the mass, it tells us that a lot of information takes a lot of work to access, and when we have it, we don't fully trust it. So why do we have the problems that this nice story my colleagues told that was so familiar to you. Why do we have that? Well, this is one of the reasons, one of the key reasons, right? So for enablers, we did the same thing, but we asked the question differently. It's not ease of access or trust, but how well or frequently do you competently execute on these enablers? So for a qualified supplier and specialty contractor list, the darker colors are more frequent, and you see frequent, common, very common for this one, but some spread. But what's that look like across all 76? Oops. Mm -hmm. all right. Very, very few are very common. There's again a widespread, so some teams are doing better than others on many of these, but collectively, it's occasional, is where most of the darkest color is there, right? So we all know what we should be doing. You know, if you read these lists of definitions and enablers, you all know it probably should look familiar to you, but how consistently are we doing and executing every day, right? And so, this is a call to action. So if I go back to the visibility ratings, ease of access and accuracy trustworthiness, let's just ask ourselves one question. What if we moved all of those answers one step to the right? What would that look like? If we just improved every item a little bit, almost all the information on job sites would be little or no effort to access and incorrect information would be very rare, either be really consistently reliable all the time or we'd have high, high degree of trust. That's the grail that we can get to, folks. So that said, let me turn this back over to Bobby to talk a little bit more about the benefits. Thank you. So if you look at moving that column just one to the right, what are the benefits? Uh, we, we, we have them here. These are common things you'd expect to see here. We can mitigate risk. We can increase productivity. Uh, we can reduce our inventory. We can reduce re-procurement costs. Uh, but I think what stood out uh, to me in this, in this chart here is that the overwhelming response of how far reaching that is. Almost all of these are over 80% that feel that these are obtainable. That's, that's transform transformative. Um, next, we looked at the, benef uh, the barriers. So a good story and then a not so good story here. The not so good is these are difficult barriers. A lot of these are deep rooted in, in organizations or some things that we can't change. This, we do live in a very difficult uh, environment and government regulations and, and all the challenges with the, the, just the size of our supply chain. Uh, but the good story is if you look at the top, the top two are IT related. Okay, it's, it's, getting, it's getting the data into the system. The data exists in most cases it just doesn't exist in a format that's able to be consumed and used and tied to a decision. So we can generally get the information available, we just need to make use of that. So that's low hanging fruit. Uh, increases in technology through APIs and things like that allow us to bolt onto systems and be able to bridge the gap and get some of that information to the right people at the right time so we can inform decisions. 
Uh, some of the other ones are organizational. Uh, we live in the silos. We're trying to break those down. Um, we've got goals and incentives that, that tend to get misaligned. C contracts kind of roll into that. I think we're also, um, we've kind of rejected the idea of sharing information. When I go back to that asymmetric data flow, so some of this information does not need to be held on to. We need, we need to challenge ourselves to open that up for the betterment of the project uh, to, to in, encourage whole project optimization. Uh, so how do we do this? We talked about the self-assessment tool, so we want everybody to use that, go through, identify, starting with the decisions uh, that, are, that are driving that, what visibility is required, identify where your organization may have an opportunity to improve, and then take action on that. So leverage the enablers, and let me just give an example of what, what I mean. So one decision that, that needs to be made is uh, what work can construction work on today, right? Uh, visibility into current inventory. An enabler for that is, you know, we have a trial allocation tool that tells us what could be worked on, right? So we have a tool, we have some visibility into inventory, we can see what's available to work on, that's great, but how old is that data? Is that, does that have everything that was received last week? Does it have everything today? How can we get more timely information? So if we can, if we can get that, uh, improve that, then that's great. But what if we can incorporate supply chain into that as well? What if, what if we can get our key suppliers and incorporate their data, fabrication status data, so that we also know what we can work on three weeks from now, right? And that's great, but how many, how many steps does it take, how many touch points does it take to get that into the system to be able to use? Can, can we get that from four steps to three steps, two steps? Can, can we eventually automate that? So that's the kind of mindset here with these enablers. You're gonna look at it and maybe you're doing it, but how do we take that and, and increase that column one step to the right in terms of ease of access and the accuracy and trustworthiness of that data. And I mentioned before the linking that to other efforts. So <clears throat> uh, most of those initiatives that you are working on are dependent on an effective supply chain and we're touching those enablers today. So use that as a catalyst of change, roll it into those initiatives, um, put somebody accountable for it so we can make that change. <coughs> so next I'll talk about the opportunity my colleagues are gonna share some stories about how they've already used this research uh, in their organizations. I'll pass it over to Annabella. Thank you, Bobby. My name's Annabella Martin with Hilti Corporation. I joined the team back in 2016. My friend and colleague, Keith, had encouraged me to join the team to provide another supplier perspective. Our colleague, David Levin, Another supplier was getting beat up too badly at some of the meetings, so they needed somebody else to be able to take some of the hits. So I was a bit nervous starting off, but the reality is it was truly a very collaborative effort, and we worked together many long hours to get to where we are today. And hopefully this embodies the type of collaboration that we need to be employing on all of our projects. My involvement in this research allowed me to better understand owner and contractors, my customers' workflows and their work practices, and also to assess how we as a supplier maybe integrate or not very well integrate into that. So it allowed me to identify certain areas from our research findings that we might be able to implement quickly. So the current state of our organization, what I noticed, is one where we have technical field personnel working very, very closely with the engineering community, and that's been taking place for many, many years. And they're developing fit-for-purpose solutions for, for the projects. Then we have sales teams with the support of our technical teams that are providing job site testing, product testing, uh, product training, and more often than I'd like to admit, trying to move mountains to get materials on site. So there's definitely an area of improvement there. And as you can see from the slide, something's missing. 
procurement's missing, supply chain. We too have been having siloed discussions, so it's not something that exists within your organization. We're suffering from that as well. So how do we, how do we improve that? One of the key takeaways from me then, and what I would envision the future state being, is really working to align early on, up front, trying to get all the stakeholders in the same room. And I know it's not easy, I've tried. I try to get engineering, procurement, and construction to have design and constructability meetings where we're also talking about some of the commercial elements, and that's not always possible. But the effort should still continue to be made. And through this alignment, we can better define a executable path of construction and, and start to identify where we might have some prob problems. So in the absence of that, or what we're trying to do in addition to that, in addition to that upfront alignment, and I normally start to ha have those discussions in feed phases, is the use of, of IT, as we identified one of the key enablers um, to be able to make the improvements needed. So we've been working and developing solutions in the engineering space to develop material catalogs, intelligent assemblies, and the information related to those could then seamlessly flow into procurement work packages where the commercial execution then becomes very easy. You're working with systems that ideally are live. You have real-time data that you can look at at any given moment and be able to make better informed decisions. But it's not just aligning and automating. It's much more than that. We must continue to communicate throughout the project life cycle and monitor the progress, especially in construction, so we can identify any constraints that might exist and then eliminate those early on so we can effectively execute the work packages. So one of the biggest takeaways for me, and, and this is information um, that our organization is, is working on, we recognize that we have to go through a transformation as a manufacturing company that's highly automated, uh, process-driven, standardized, European manufacturing company, it takes time to change. But we recognize that it's, that it's needed so we can better integrate into our customers' project workflows. So in the end, for me, two, two big takeaways um, through this experience is, as suppliers and solutions provider, we need to learn and better understand what are the best practices that are being utilized by our customers, by the owner and contractors. Truly understand what those are, and then how do we integrate? And then secondly, create integrated project teams that are working together to define the data requirements, the schedule, the timing of the materials, so when an activity needs to take place, we can ensure that the material is there. And in my mind, the only way to do that is through collaboration. So thank you so much. I'll pass it on to my colleague, Lori, who will provide her perspective. Hi everybody, good afternoon. I'm Lori Getz. I am Director of Procurement and Supply Chain for Matrix North American Construction. As a member of the supply chain profession my entire career, I am very, very excited that our construction industry is realizing the need and benefit of early involvement of procurement and supply chain on our projects. So what is Matrix doing as a result of this research to, to further that? And one of the things that we're doing, if you think back to Bobby's um, slide on barriers, one of the barriers was organization. So we're looking at tearing down organizational silos in the project team. And one way we're doing that is the early involvement of procurement and supply chain with our business development and estimating groups with projects that we're bidding. So as we've seen on the, in the research and as we know, um, the early involvement of procurement helps with supplier onboarding and selection. 
It identifies materials that require long lead delivery so we can look at those first. It makes sure that we're taking significant project flow down and getting that to our suppliers and our subcontractors. And all of this thereby is risk mitigation. Another barrier that was shown on, on Bobby's um, slide was technology. So what we're looking at with technology is track and trace. Um, we are very excited to be implementing RFID technology. We are actually looking to implement it enterprise-wise, enterprise-wide with our entire company, but right now we are running it on a current project that we have in place, so that's kind of exciting for us. Another uh, technology is we're implementing project control software. So the project control software will assist us with accurate drawing transmittals. Um, it will also help us with visibility of materials and also visibility of the project health, which is gonna be really important to the project team and to our, our management groups. And lastly, as a company that has grown through um, acquisition, we're looking at the integration of all of our business locations and offices under one business system model. So those are kind of the things that we're tackling um, with, with barriers. But that's low-hanging fruit, and, and Bobby said that as well. It's low-hanging low -hanging fruit. Putting some muscle into it for us is going to be using the self-assessment tool. And this is what our research is, is going to show is the use of this self-assessment tool to provide visibility for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll this out to our operations groups, and our internal stakeholders will come back to us and tell us what they think the, the issues are with visibility for procurement and supply chain on a project. What are, the, what are the problems? And then are they problems or are they areas of, of education and, and further opportunities? But either way, we can take action. If it's a problem, we can identify what the problem is and figure out how we're gonna correct it. And if it's an area of education, we can do that as well. And once we do that, once we identify the areas of visibility and, and how we're gonna address those, then we can take action and then further implement that into other areas of productivity, such as advanced work packaging. So thank you for your time, and I'm gonna turn this over to Keith. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I'm Keith Churchill. I'm the Corporate Manager of Construction Technology for Bechtel. Wrong green button. Okay. So uh, as constructors, we're beginning to see a transition in the way that our field personnel are making decisions. Uh, whereas in the past, uh, you know, we would gather information from whatever means possible, meetings, uh, uh, a report, hearsay, uh, eavesdropping, the, the smoke pin, and then, and then make our decisions based on, on more of a gut feel. Um, now with the advancements in technology and, and connectivity, we actually have the ability to get all of the data that a lot of our field personnel need to make decisions in the palm of our hand. The problem with that is that if we can't trust the data that we, we, we're looking at in the palm of our hands, we're really gonna struggle to make those justified, informed decisions. And if, if the information's wrong, then, then those decisions quickly become misguided. Um, Bechtel is, uh, is taking action to transition our execution strategy to support, um, to support advanced work packaging. And when you couple advanced work packaging with 4D and 5D planning, you really begin to recognize that we need to put a further emphasis on the data that's produced from our design and from our material supply chain in order to support advanced work packaging. We can no longer continue to progress solely based on paper documents. Um, when we began to uh, when we began to take a look at at all of the all of the different decision points, all of the visibility factors, all of the enablers, uh, your initial response is going to be, "Oh yeah, we did that." You can just completely write it off at face value. It was great that the team challenged everybody to take a look and dive deeper into what it takes to actually get the data, make it accurate, and keep it up to date. I think that if you really dive into it, you'll find that there's a lot of person-to-person -person interaction. There's a lot of uh, Excel spreadsheet to, to, um, to database interaction, and that, that ends, up, um, ends up with data that's, that's either filtered, out of date, or withheld for whatever reason. In order for us to be successful, we have to have transparent data. 
which means getting data directly from the source. And, we, and in order to do that, we've got to make it easier for all of us to integrate within our systems so that we get the live data and we're all talking the same language. Within Bechtel, as a result of the research team, we're really going to take a look at a couple of the enablers that we think we can make an impact on um, extremely quickly. The first is, is taking a look at what we do um, with our suppliers when we're developing our POs and our contracts. Uh, and stealing a, a line from one of the uh, videos last night, we've really got to sit down and define right up front at the beginning so that everybody understands what information we need, when we need it, and in what format. Because when something goes wrong, and we all know it's going to go wrong, we need to make sure that we minimize that negative impact. The second thing that we need to do is we've got to, re, um, we've got to adjust our, our, contract, um, our contract language in order to promote partnership and collaboration instead of litigation. When in, when, if, if we use, utilize this transparent information as a weapon in the courtroom and we lose that, that, team, that teamwork and that, and that partnership that we've built and that trust that we've built, uh, we, we, we tend to make an already difficult situation on our projects even worse. Um, going along with the theme of the, of, the, of the conference, you know, imagine what we could do if, if we just made that small jump to, um, to more reliable, uh, more frequent, and more trustworthy data. You know, we've got to get, a point in the, get to a point in the industry very soon where we don't release work packages that the material may not be there or isn't there, and we've got to keep the, uh, the foreman and general foreman at the work front. If we can get them to just concentrate on installing the, the material that's already been delivered, we can improve productivity, improve our quality, and most importantly, perform at world-class safety. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who's going to talk about how he's breaking down the barriers from an owner's perspective. Thank you. So I'm Chris McConnell from uh, Ontario Power Generation. and um, so. Uh, I joined the uh, refurbishment uh, project uh, about two and a half years ago, and uh, my boss, Mike, asked me, uh, he's going to ask me one simple question. He said, I need you to tell me where we are with parts from now until the, the project's over. So um, th this is uh, an example of, well, is a, is a live example of what we came up with. Um, it's an automated dashboard that goes through the material status for our entire project. So there's 26,000 line items of data that has drill down capability. Um, but the color codes are, are fairly simple here. Gray, the materials on site. Uh, green, yellow, and red indicate uh, levels of risk um, for measuring the predicted delivery dates to the schedule. So the other key part about um, what we're able to, to do here is that this is uh, vendor supplied data to a secure database. So um, there is no sort of filtering and, and things that uh, we've talked about. Um, is This is just the pure data uh, as good as we could get it um, in, into the database. Um, but the, the, the real key here is um, quite quickly you can zone in on the things that you need to take care of. So if you've got red deliveries on a particular project, you can find out what those materials are understand the impact uh, and take actions. Um, and they'd be actions that we would take, you know, every day on, on different projects. But the ability to see it ahead of time is, is the real key. Um, so with that, I, I was going to flip to a video here which gives some uh, perspective from the execution side. And uh, um, you guys will get to meet Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Allen, Senior VP of Execution for the $12.8 billion Darlington Refurb Project, Canada's largest clean energy project. My team has asked me to provide some context on the real life impacts of improving supply chain visibility on large construction projects. We are 50% complete on the first unit of four on the project and have experienced very few material availability issues in large part based on the ability to see the issues before they impact the schedule. My project management teams have been successful in addressing the vast majority of the issues and ones that were not able to be resolved, the impacts were minimized through really good upfront planning. I've been executing projects for 30 years and this visibility across multiple EPCs presented in the same understandable format measured to the same approved schedule has allowed prevention of these problems. 
Experience has indicated that projects such as this one have many material issues. They impact the overall performance on cost, schedule, and sometimes even safety. The upfront effort made in obtaining this visibility has proven to be a great investment. The research team has been able to document a lot of great information. It's my opinion that every major construction project can benefit from focusing on the supply chain and material visibility in the planning phases. Please feel free to come see the team to gain some insights on how to improve your next project's overall performance. Okay, thank you to the team for sharing those uh, wonderful stories of just the possibility that can be results that are already being uh, realized in the industry uh, and, and sharing your perspectives and how you've used the tool and, and what we're doing. Uh, it's fantastic. So the opportunity that I think exists and what we're excited about is, is the opportunity to really break down these silos. Let, let's open them up so we can see what's going on in each of those. Try to get our IT systems and interoperability and integrated uh, information into a single source of truth so that we can better inform decisions and, and increase our project performance. And we really believe that supply chain visibility is the next breakthrough uh, in project performance and can be a catalyst for uh, transformation. So with that, I think we've got about 10 minutes, so I'm gonna check out the app here for some Q&A. Okay, so there were quite a few questions related to uh, some of the benefits and uh, how were they quantified? Were, were we able to quantify them? Uh, is there a rigorous manner in which we would do that? Um, and maybe Bill, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that. Sure, so of course, as you all know, quantification of what could be is or what, what have we missed is difficult. It's always easy to see the cost of something, but the benefits are harder. We are continuing on uh, for a few more months, what we call Thrust 2. We already have several case studies, and we're collecting a few more to help give us some parameters of the data and what, you know, what the current investment is in these huge buffers, and how can we uh, start to reflect that decision framework to help make some good choices, and therefore you know, estimate the benefits and you know, continue to drive the business case to move it forward. So look back uh, in the not too distant future for some more on that. Great. Thank you. Uh, several questions also related to advanced work packaging um, and just wanting maybe some more information on, you know, if we already use that as a catalyst in creating visibility, uh, can, we, can we elaborate on, on the AWP side and how this fits in there? And um, maybe Keith, you mentioned that a little bit in your uh, study there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, understanding where the material is is is, is truly paramount in, in, in order to, to uh, successfully execute advanced work packaging. Um, you know, we we've seen uh, cases where we've gone all the way back to the suppliers and, and worked with them to coordinate our materials in order to make sure that they arrived on site in Conex is by 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 installation work package. So that's that's the ideal situation is that we've. We've pushed the, the work packaging requirements up through engineering, up through the procurement supply chain, and that way we can obviously monitor you know, the, the wave of materials as they come in from, from overseas and all of these different places so that they align with the construction sequence and we minimize that lay down yard exposure that you talked about earlier. And if I could add to that, just the early involvement of procurement in, in that whole process will be able to identify to the suppliers and work with the suppliers on what's needed to deliver that equipment. So what kind of visibility they have to give us in what format and things like that so that we can support the advanced work packaging process. Right. And, and I'll add the work that we did on the definitions is entirely consistent and coherent with AWP philosophy. In fact, a few of them have engineering work packages, construction work packages, installation work packages, and so on. And so. Uh, we've always saw that as a compliment, and if you want to take the definitions, which we recommend you do, and think about implementing them in your tools mm -hmm. and your contracts, that you should have no resistance or not find any friction there against your, your AWP efforts. You should directly support it. Great. Thank you. Uh, a few more questions here related to um, 
how do we ensure quality information from our suppliers? How, how do you effectively manage that? Um, how, how, do you, how do you know it's trustworthy? How do you ensure uh, the quality of that? And, and maybe if Annabelle on the supplier side and Lori can maybe have <laughs> a discussion on that, that'd be great. <laughs> Um, so I would say that really, you know, in ensuring that the supplier is giving you the right information, a lot of it obviously um, relates to the quality of the supplier itself. Is it uh, a, a partner that you're working with where you have had um, successful execution of previous projects? And so there is an element of, of trust there. Um, I think the the outside of that, then the other key element is, is really the communication up front. You know, how do you want to measure quality? What, is, what are the requirements that you're looking for? And, and sometimes that can be a challenge because as manufacturers, we have certain intellectual property and certain processes that, you know, we're limited in how much we can share. But most of the times we've been able to work through that through a conversation. Right? And then those things can be built into, into contracts, but before a contract is even executed, those conversations need to be had up front. And I will add to that, that um, early on when we first started talking, and uh, Annabella had said that she was asked to be part of the team because we were beating up on David from Victaulic. You know, when we first started talking about early involvement, of course the salesman says, we should be at the table right at the very beginning. We should be sitting there with you guys when you're signing the contract. And I'm like, coming from procurement, oh hell no, because that means you're gonna name your price, we're not gonna be able to competitively bid. And we went back and forth on that a lot, and around and around, and Annabella came in, but it truly is a collaboration, and it truly is a partnership. And, and our projects are such that we really, really do have to work together with our suppliers and our subcontractors to ensure competitiveness, but also to ensure that the project's gonna flow like it should. I think there's, a, I think there's a, still a, a really high amount of manual data transfer mm -hmm. to, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. a, you know, whether it's person to person or some, you know, something I talked about, like, you know, spreadsheet to database, you know, the, the more that we can completely integrate our systems through the use of the APIs that Bobby mentioned earlier, I think that that's gonna take, take us to the next level in terms of, of reliability and trustworthiness and, and you know, just, just taking the people out of the, out of the conversation and going directly to the data source is, mm -hmm. is, is extremely important. Thank you. What about uh, Chris from the owner's perspective? What are your thoughts? So the, I, I think one of the, the biggest things um, that we saw benefit from is, is we took our visibility from a narrative-based visibility where you were sort of relying on on, uh, on a project manager to say, yeah, I'm okay with parts and, and these three things are a problem and, and we sort of looked at a chart that wasn't um, data-based rather than, than the narrative-based. So moving to that, um, that data-centric um, idea is, is the way to go. Um, it, it takes away a lot of risk and, it, and sort of drives, drives the teams to, to come with a better understanding of where they are um, and how much risk they actually have on their project. So. Great, thank you. Uh, a few folks interested in, uh, so the, the survey tool and the self-assessment, uh, when is a good time to use it? Uh, you know, is it, um, who should be involved in that process? So um, guidance on when and how should we use the tool? I guess I'll, I'll start with that. Um, what we found, and, and it's nothing complicated, it's basically, it's our list of enablers and list of visibility assessments, which are in the back of the book, and you can score yourselves on that and you know, compare that to the averages, but I'm not sure the averages are necessarily a benchmark. I think we all want to be in the high level. Uh, we found, and we went in the team, we also went outside to people outside the team and said, and we found, I think, the, the people that found the most benefit from it were they, they used it to have a group conversation inside. So they put a few people in the room and they collectively scored that and used that to be really be a good reflective self-examination of where that is. And I think it started for a lot of people inside the team and a few people on the outside that we went to for uh, you know, kind of validation and ex extending our results. 
really found it useful to have a small team of people together to start that conversation. And so, you know, the best time is now, right? Uh, I think you do want to have a sense of, you know, who should be in the room. You want to get different perspectives. And so, um, putting those perspectives together, I think, is important because that really drives the conversations in the company and then really drives action. Um, it's very easy, I think it was Keith said, you know, when you look at these things at a high level, of course we're doing those things. But when you really dig down and say, maybe we're not doing it as well or as consistently as we are, we think we should be, that really then drives the action. And if you look at the spread of the responses, you know, every company is different, everything's there, so it's hard to say these are the five things that are the ones everybody should do. It's, you gotta self-assess first and then think about where it is uh, to start and where, you know, you're gonna find the most bang for your investment. And it needs to be a continuous process too, right? So you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it every month, but you'd, you'd wanna go back and, and reassess, see, see where you've gotten to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just to maybe wrap that question, uh, the other piece of it is who should be involved So from stakeholders? This is just a procurement thing. Who should be at the table to participate in that? Well, I plan on using the tool with operations. So I'm going to use it with our um, operations group, our project teams um, across the board, just to get their opinion on where the visibility is lacking. We're, we're using it in our whole project organization, so in, inside of nuclear, so. Okay, well, we're just about out of time here. Um, it's a pleasure to share this. Again, it's, uh, the, the tool is it's a practical, very practical uh, research, and we look forward to seeing you. If you've got questions, the team, the entire team will be there at the booth, and, and we'll be there to, to help you out, so thank you for the time. <laughs>